back purging, a process of shielding the back side of the weld as you weld it to avoid one big problem known as carbide precipitation. Now what does all of that mean and how does it work? Well we're going to show you today only on the fabrication series. Now in fine TFS fashion here, we're not going to get too metallurgical about this topic and we're not going to get too dumb about it either. But first we have to really define exactly what it is that we're working with and exactly what we're trying to avoid to really explain what purging or shielding is all about. Now let's start with carbide precipitation. What is that? That is a condition that occurs in austenitic stainless steels. Now austenitic stainless steels are the most common ones you find in the stainless steel market like 300 series, even 200 series. Now the 300 series are things like 304 stainless, 303 meaning the machinable version of it, what's most commonly known as 316, 305s, I mean there's tons of them. All 300 series stainless steels are austenitic stainless steels. Now carbide precipitation is a condition that occurs in austenitic stainless steels where the elements inside of it like carbon, uh, chrome, nickel, a bunch of different alloys, titanium, all the rest of those things. Inside of that, they can make the construction of that 300 series stainless reacts with the atmosphere. Atmosphere meaning everything that we're breathing in, what we're working with. Those elements inside of it, around 800 to 1400 degrees Fahrenheit, will react with the atmosphere. That condition is carbide precipitation. It's also known as oxidation. It's sometimes most commonly known, actually, as sugaring. Some people call sugaring coking, some people call it cauliflowering, some people call it dirty, some people call it cracking, some people call it just pure sh**. But either way, this is what we're looking at, this is what we're trying to avoid when we're doing purging, when we're actually shielding the actual backside of the weld at that temperature from the atmosphere. We're taking the atmosphere away from that weld. That's the simplified version of it if you really wanted to know about it. Back purging is to prevent sugaring. Back purging is to prevent all of the things that we don't want in that weld. And we're gonna get a little bit deeper into this one in just a few minutes. But let's just talk about exactly what we're looking with right now. Let's take some 304 stainless steel, let's weld it all together, and I'm gonna show you how to purge. Now, for the purpose of control here, I'm gonna do this first piece with absolutely nothing protecting the inside of that weld. We're gonna let it sugar up. I'm gonna weld it a little bit hotter, and I'm gonna go a little bit slower so we can get some really big, thick, full pen on it, and I can get a nice close-up and show you exactly what sugaring and oxidation, all the rest of that stuff is. Then we're gonna do the second piece with argon gas. I'm gonna do a full purge on it, show you how to do that. The third piece we're gonna do with a flux composition called solar flux. I'm gonna show you how to get all that set up and all the rest of that good stuff. So, right now, let's weld this one up. There's absolutely nothing on the inside of that one protecting it from the atmosphere. It's full exposure. And after we cut it all in half here, I can show you this right here. This is exactly what sugaring is. This is exactly what we don't want. That weld is technically now a failure because it is more prone to cracking, it's more brittle, and of course the corrosion resistance of it is now gone because there was nothing shielding those elements in that metal from the atmosphere. If ever you look inside of a piece of stainless that was welded like this and you see any of this granular crap on the inside of it, it was not purged at all. And this is exactly what back purging or shielding is aimed at preventing. So let's start with some argon gas. I'm gonna take a tube, we're gonna fill it up with some argon gas, and we're gonna do a full back perch on it. Now this is an area where it gets a little bit confusing to people, but take this for what it is. All of the settings that you read about or you find during your research, including the settings that I'm gonna show you in this video, are guidelines. There is no magical cookie cutter setting that's going to guarantee you a full on successful back perch. It doesn't exist because everything is subject to change. There's always variables in those setups that people use. So what you must do is follow this what people do. Take the size of their part, what they're purging, what they're working with, how much flow, all the rest of that good stuff, and apply that to your own and try it out. Make sure you take some notes throughout the course of time when you do that. But in order to set up a successful back purge or to get the proper equipment for it, you need two independent systems to do that or independently controlled lines to run your proper purge setup. 
One of those lines has to go to the TIG torch. It's going to provide all of the shielding gas for the top side of that well as it normally would. Then you need a second system that's going to serve as your purge line. So that can run to a purge box, a purge chamber, uh, the actual part that you're, you're going to use like we're going to show you in this video here, or it could run to like something like a trailing cup. Now that runs at usually a different flow rate and that's why you have to have the two separate systems. Now what you'll commonly find is two bottles and two regulators or like me in this case what I use is a dual flow regulator. I can set one line up that services the TIG torch to whatever flow rate I need it and the other line can get set up to the actual purge line to run at whatever flow rate I need that at. So let's get this one started up here. I'm going to set my dual flow regulator up to 10 CFH. Then we're gonna run over to the part. Now, blocking off your part is very, very important. Now, I'm gonna use purge plugs on this one, and you'll see some of these coming out in the future as the fabrication series progresses here. But you need, very, very important on it, you need one line in and one line out, or one port in and one port out. You must have the vent hole. The vent hole is there to push out all the atmospheric gases and replace them with argon gas. You cannot plug it. Now, I will show you exactly what it looks like if you do. And it's actually pretty spectacular when I did it. But after we get this set up, we have our line in, we have our port that flows all of the gases out, argon's flowing through the part, and we're gonna weld it up just the same as we did before with all of the other setups on it. So as soon as all of this gets welded up here, we're gonna cut it in half again, and I'm gonna show you exactly what it looks like on the inside of it. Now check this out. The inside of this, there is none of that sugaring. It is all nice, it is fluid, it is clean. It looks like there's a weld on the inside as well as the outside. That's full penetration, that's completely shielded the way it should be, and that weld will now be strong and it will continue to service throughout its life. That is a passing weld. Now, I did only explain the significance of having a vent hole in your purge system, but you're probably wondering, well, how bad could it possibly be? Well, at a great risk of severe personal injury to myself to ensure that you do not try this at home, watch this video. We're gonna take a purge plug, we're gonna stuff it down into that tube as far as possible to make sure that it completely seals up all the way around and does not blow out. I'm gonna do the exact same thing with the purge line itself completely sealed, will not blow out. So now the actual joint is the only place that argon gas can escape from until you get to a certain point in there where, boom! Pretty spectacular, right? Let's watch it again in slow motion. That was an actual explosion. All of this liquid hot stainless steel is spraying everywhere along with the gases and everything else like that. So why do you need the vent hole? That is exactly why you need the vent hole. If you don't put one in there, the metal's gonna do it for you. So make sure you have a vent hole in your system. Now solar flux is a chemical compound that comes in a finely ground powder form. That powder is then mixed with an evaporative solution to create a paste. The paste is then applied to the inside of the part at the weld joint, which serves as a barrier or a shield against the atmospheric gases when it's welded. That basically eliminates the need for argon gas as your shielding gas. Now in order to mix all of this, we're going to need definitely some sort of receptacle to put it in, in case you see this little cap that I use here, and we're going to need an applicator. And to use as a binder, we're going to need methyl alcohol. Now methyl alcohol is mostly known as methanol, or there's a dozen other names which I'm going to flash up on the screen here, but this gasoline additive is pretty much pure methanol, and that's what we're going to use as our binding agent. So we'll stick a little solar flux in the receptacle, mix it up with some methanol, and I'm going to show you a couple of different uh, ways to do this where you don't really want to do it. First, we're going to start by making it too runny. And if you get in close here and look at it, if it's that runny and that consistency, it's not going to spread evenly over the part. So we're going to go the extreme opposite on this one, and I'm going to mix up way too much solar flux uh, to not enough methanol. And as soon as we get it all mixed up in here, we'll get in close once again. Now check this out. That's just a little bit too clumpy. So if we applied it to the part just like this, it will spread on really thick in some places and really thin in other ones. So let's try to even it out. A little more splash of methanol, see if we can get this just right, because we want a nice, clean, even paste to go over the top of it. Right about here is about right. So if we apply it to the part with the brush, it'll go on clean, it'll go on really uniform, it'll go on quite nicely. And that's what we want as a uniformity. We want the solar flux to actually do its job. 
Now remember that methanol is toxic and poisonous and it cannot be rendered non-toxic or poisonous. So make sure that you exercise all cautions when working with it as you apply it to your part. Now after we've applied the paste to both pieces, we're going to set them down and we're going to let them dry and let the methanol evaporate because methanol is flammable. So if we try to weld it while it's on there, it will catch on fire, it will burn. So what does it look like and how do you know that it's actually dry? Take a look at these two, this dark gray versus the light gray. The light gray is dry, the dark gray is not. Now you can check this in your own receptacle just like we're doing right here, but this right here after it evaporates that means that it's in powdered form again so again once you actually have it on your pieces or on your work pieces and applied and it's dry don't touch it because if you do it's back in powdered form again and it will come off of that area meaning it's not going to shield when you weld it now we're going to weld it up just the same as we did before and you notice on the inside there's nothing really there except for the solar flux and how it welds is really nice and leaves a nice uniform finish on it. But we're going to put it up next to the piece that was not shielded at all and you can actually see a difference as we weld it. On the right there's no shielding so as we weld it you'll see this big clumpy matter starting to form on the back side of that weld which is your sugaring versus the one on the left where there's absolutely nothing at all. So let's cut these two in half just the same as we did before and normally you wouldn't be able to clean up the inside but I'm going to take a wire brush to it and you can actually see the normal finish it leaves is this kind of glassy looking uh, kind of finish on the top of it. That's the flux doing its job but after we get it cleaned off let's look close here there is that uniformity to it. It's not clumpy it's actually relatively smooth and still resembles a weld on the inside. So when you put it up next to the piece that was not shielded at all you can see that there is a major difference and this is what we use solar flux for when we want to save on argon. Now this point right here in the video is exactly where we're going to hit a dividing line. I really don't like doing this, but we have to go over it. If you've ever, ever tried to research the answer to the question of do I need to purge, you're going to find two very separate sides and a whole lot of gray in the middle of it. What does all of that mean? Well, if you say, do I need to back purge, you're going to find on one side the I've been welding for 20 years, I've done x-ray welds, I'm certified, you need to purge everything. Then you're going to find I've been doing this for 20 years and I don't always purge it and you know the parts never failed and it's really awesome and it's fine, everything's great, don't worry about it. Well, what about everything in between? All that gray area. That's extreme yes and extreme no. What about everything in between where people don't really talk about and don't really have the answer to that leaves you still wondering, do I need to purge? Well, the answer is very, very simple. Is your weld going to be exposed to any elements? If it's yes, it needs to be shielded. If your, ele if your weld is not going to be exposed to any of the elements, the answer is no. If your weld is structural and it's going to be exposed to the elements and needs to stay true and pass, then yes. If you think you can get away with it and it's not structural or you don't really want to mess with purging, then the answer is no. At the end of the day, it's technically up to you and this is an area where not a lot of people will actually address or touch on. Me personally, if I know the back side of that weld is going to be exposed to any of the atmospheric elements when I weld it and it's a reactive metal such as stainless steel or titanium, it better be purged, especially if it's got my name on it. The rest, that's up to you if you want to do it or not. Now the other big question is, what actually needs to be back purged? Well, eh, you know what, the list is actually quite huge and there's a, there's a whole lot of metals that do and do not require it and there's also instances, circumstances, jobs and uh, other situations where it's actually required to do so and that's usually listed on the job. But what I primarily work with here in the automotive performance industry, stainless steel and titanium, those need to be back purged. The mild steel, the chromoly, the, uh, the aluminum, all the rest of those, those do not need to be back purged. But here's the thing, some instances, some jobs, some grades of metal, some aluminums need to be back purged on some jobs. Some chromoly needs to be back purged on some jobs, depending on what it is. Some steel, some iron, some oil, you know, all kinds of stuff. There's a lot of different metals, but the best thing to do is look, find out, look it up, see if it's required or not. If it's not, then don't worry about it. But again, this is all up to if that actual reactive metal hits the atmosphere or is exposed to the atmosphere or not dictates when you actually need to do it. So again, that's just kind of up to you. Look it up, check it out, figure it out.
Now that just about wraps it up for everything that I have related to back purging and I hope you have found it useful and maybe solved some of your problems or answered some of your questions. But if you have any more questions or comments, drop them in the comments box below. If you need to get in touch with me, send me an email on the fabricationseries.com website, hit me up on facebook.com slash the fabricator series, or follow along on Instagram at the.fabricator. Now make sure you check out the description below here and I got all of that information in there. I want to thank you guys for watching as always. Don't forget to subscribe to the Fabrication Series YouTube channel. Check out some of these more awesome videos related to fabrication and really cool content. And make sure you head over to the FabricationSeries.com website to check out some of the really new awesome stuff that we're selling up there. So, again, thank you guys very much for watching. I'll see you guys on the next episode.